um, filaments with different densities, they have different refractive indices and it's steering the light around a little bit. So it's jogging the light around. And what that can be viewed as is just the same as a particle scattering light and, and, uh, and causing attenuation. So um, these happen wherever you have uh, steep picnic lines and maybe you've even seen these when you've mixed salty and fresh water together. You can also see it when hot air is rising off the road. Okay, so um, the list responds to these, these Schlieren because it has a small acceptance angle. Remember, the list acceptance angle is 0 0.02 degrees. So let's just imagine we have, have uh, transmitted light and it hits um, a particle. So here's our light source, hits a particle. We have a sensor with a, with a large acceptance angle and a sensor with a small acceptance angle. Um, so with an instrument with a large acceptance angle, some of the scattered light will be interpreted as transmitted. It's accepted as transmitted light. So that's what the name acceptance comes from. Um, whereas the light that's scattered off in a uh, 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 larger angular direction will be uh, not be viewed as accepted as transmitted. That'll be viewed as scattered light. Look at the comparison with the small acceptance angle instrument. Pretty much any scattering that happens means that it's not going to, the light isn't going to be accepted as, as transmitted light. So what the list is very demanding in, say, in accepting what transmitted light is, where the AC9 is a little bit more generous. Now, why would you be more generous? It's because it, it's an easier measurement to make. It's less prone to getting screwed up by fouling and other things. So, so there's reasons to have that more generous acceptance angle. So now if you do the same thing by putting in some, a filament of light, you get interaction of light with that filament of light, uh, that filament of, of different density water with the larger acceptance angle instrument. Uh, the light gets bent a bit, but it still gets viewed as transmitted light. With the list, it gets bent a bit. Now it's not transmitted light anymore. Okay, so as the acceptance angle goes down, your interpreted beam attenuation goes up, especially in the presence of these Schlieren. Okay, so back to this figure, what we see is that some data seem to be getting a lot of, of uh, attenuation when there's not much total area in suspension. But then some other data points, hey, they look pretty good. You get that nice linear relationship with them. Um, so this is the work of Jing Tao, who's a PhD student with me and who was in this class uh, a couple years ago. Um, so <clears throat> what, uh, what Jing did was, was look at whether, whether those points were on the line or off the line, whether it depended on the buoyancy frequency. The buoyancy frequency is a, is a measure of stratification in the water column. So this is the, the formula for the buoyancy frequency. It's just gravitational acceleration over the fluid density times the density gradient all raised to the uh, power of 0 0.5. So if you have a big density gradient, you get a big buoyancy frequency. So what, uh, what Jing did was look at what the buoyancy frequencies of all the points were, and she found that um, um, these points up here all had buoyancy frequencies greater than 0 0.05. So these points that were falling off this linear trend all showed up when, the buoyant, when you had a lot of stratification in the water column. So she concluded from that that, that Schlieren was causing the effect. So um, now if we look at the other sensors that we were deploying, here's the CP from the AC9. There's the data separated by buoyancy frequency. They're all showing up on a, a nice line. So the AC9 is not affected by the Schlieren effect. There's two reasons. One, large acceptance angle. Two, the, it, it pulls the uh, suspension into a tube. When it pulls the suspension into the tube, it breaks down the density um, differences between the fluid, so you're not going to see that filament behavior. Why is this uh, line a little less steep than this line? Bigger acceptance angle here. So it's not, it's not interpreted, it's, 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 it's leaving out some of the attenuated light and saying it's transmitted because of its bigger acceptance angle. So that's why you get these different slopes here. Okay, so the AC9 has a larger acceptance angle and it mixes the water, so it's not affected by this, this uh, Schlieren effect. Then we look at backscatter um, at uh, 650 versus total area. Same thing, doesn't matter what the buoyancy frequency is. Why is that? Because the Schlieren 
are just affecting light going in the forward direction. They're not affecting light going in the backward direction. So the b measurement of backscatter simply isn't affected by this, this, this mixing effect. So what do I have there? Oh, I've got my screen again. And there's a blank slide. Okay. Um, and uh, so if you ignore the Schlieren effect, which would be really easy to do, in fact, um, many, you know, the list is a, uh, I would characterize it as a robust, widely applied instrument now. So you could do your calibration of your list in the absence of, of any Schlieren, get a nice um, linear relationship between, the, uh, between your, your list attenuation and the suspended particulate matter. But then if you put it into a picnicline where there was strong stratification, you might get really high readings of attenuation that you would uh, interpret as a particle rich layer. And this is just an example of what could happen. And, and, and there's definitely examples of this in the literature because people often won't measure SPM at the same time they're doing the list. This is a depth profile um, uh, for one of the profiles we did. Um, this, this, uh, uh, the x-axis here shows potential density, which is on this um, dotted line here. The top axis shows the SPM in grams per meter cubed, and that's what these lines with the open symbols are. The, um, and then these stars, these asterisks here, are the actual uh, filtration measurements of, of SPM. So the AC9 and the backscatter um, sensor are shown here, and they show the same thing. There's there's uh, less sediment at the at near the surface. It increases to uh, uh, kind of doubles uh, down at five meters, and then it falls back down as you go deeper in the water column. And that's pretty much backed up by the um, direct measurements of SPM. If you, in an uncritical way, apply, looked at your list attenuation data and inferred SPM from that, you get an entirely incorrect picture where you have this pretty significant particle rich layer showing up at, at two meters here that then falls off rapidly and agrees with these others. So you might infer, as many people have, that there's some kind of particle trapping in the picnicline occurring when there's no such thing going on at all. Yeah, Colin? Mm -hmm. right. One is pumping through, and therefore isn't getting Schlieren, but also might be breaking aggregates, yep. right, which could give rise to this big layer. The backscattering sensor isn't breaking up particles, but it still sees the same thing. And so that way you can say, well, it could have been the difference between aggregate and disaggregated water that would give the difference between the list and the ACI. The fact that you have the backscattering sensor there, too, gives you a further sense. Yeah, which is great. I mean, I, I, I was one of those people who would always say, how can you do something like pump your sample when you know you're destroying your aggregates in there? You can't get a good estimate of mass that way. Thing is, is we found out that, that uh, mass doesn't really, I mean, the, the relationship between the optical property and the mass doesn't depend on size. So it doesn't really matter that you break them up. You still get a robust um, estimate. Yeah. So if you were just using this to do size distribution, you'd say, oh my gosh, I have all these big particles, and it's actually... Yeah, so Jing did that in the paper, which just went in, and I didn't put in these slides, but the list gets wildly yeah, order of magnitude wrong for the concentration of big particles, which doesn't affect our total area numbers because we rely on the camera for the big particles. But then it does something really interesting in the small particles. It makes this really peak distribution, and we think would like to know whether we're right or not. We think what it's doing is there should be secondary peaks from the big particles that the list thinks are there. So now it's assigning, it's saying there's less small particles there because I should have a secondary peak from the big particles. So we're getting these kind of weird peak things. It doesn't affect the overall total area in the small sizes that much, but it gives you an incorrect distribution. Um, uh, I'll just go on a little more because I've already gone over. Um, another thing that a reviewer picked up on this, which, which was a great point, is, well, why do you see the big effect in this profile here when the steepest gradient is here? Why don't you see the worst problems here 
um, and not here. So I, I neglected to mention this pale gray as the 0 0.05 buoyancy frequency zone. So anywhere in here, the buoyancy frequencies are problematic for the list. So why don't we see the list giving nonsense through all of these? Anybody know anything about turbulence? I'm sure you all do. But turbulence is a fundamentally intermittent thing, OK? Um, so um, we've got stratification here. So we need energy to break down that stratification. If you don't break down that stratification, you're not going to see Schlier and you're going to be going through constant density water. So um, here where the stratification is most intense, perhaps we're not seeing Schlier and because the stratification is so intense it's not being broken down. The other thing is our instrument package is interacting with the stratification the whole time. So sometimes there's Schlier and sometimes there's not. But um, so the point is, is that it's very difficult to deal with this effect with a small acceptance angle instrument like the list. If you have high buoyancy frequencies, you're going to have to be suspicious of your data. The nice thing is, is it's pretty easy to deploy a backscatter sensor along with your list and then have a backup for, for um, concentration and pot potentially a trap for telling you when you're going to get rotten size distributions. So. Okay, so. Uh, where are we back at the Bay of Fundy? Um, so in summary, attenuation and backscatter coefficients are good proxies for mass concentration. Slope of the attenuation spectrum is a good proxy for particle size, and backscatter ratio is a good proxy for particle composition. Um, now, uh, you know, I could have used other data to, to show that even better. I mean, Jing's data do, but I just love the Korea data so much right now that I focused on, on those. But it was nice in the Korea data that we were seeing full consistency between the mass measurements, size measurements, and the optical proxies. Um, Schlieren produced an increase in CP derived from list. Uh, the buoyancy frequency is a good tool to eliminate inaccurate estimates of CP, but if you are working in estuarine environments or if you're working in places with strong uh, picnoclines, this is going to be a problem for the list and you should always be aware of it and ready to address that. It's out there enough now that people should know about this and you shouldn't, you shouldn't get caught up on, on uh, having um, nonsense estimates of, of uh, particles due to concentration. Okay, um, the other neat thing is Schlieren do not affect the CP in the, in the uh, backscatter um, sensor derived from the wet labs AC9 and the BB2FL. From my perspective, I would go with the backscatter sensor because it's pretty simple and, and I don't have to buy a AC9 to do it. But, but really, I think you should always have a backscatter sensor if you're doing particle stuff. Okay, that's what I got. Thanks. Questions? Yeah, in October. But not going to a meeting in Israel that I'm supposed to be at with Emmanuel. But yeah. Yeah? Did I see a hand somewhere? Yeah? Can Syrian form in freshwater systems? And if so, how? They uh, can't form. I, I mean, if you had a really um, strong thermal stratification. So if you had, you know, solar heating through the day, you could form Schlieren in, in fresh water. So that'd be the way to do it. They're really common in, in brackish settings. So it doesn't take much salinity for, to, to, to amp up the stratification enough so that you see Schlieren. But um, yeah, so I, I would think in lake environments where you had strong thermal stratification, you could see them. But that's, a, that's speculation. I don't have proof of that. Go for it. <laughs> the NRDX versus organics, what other measurements can you take to confirm that that's going to be the past? People in the past have done, to, you know, the, the crudest way is to do, you know, loss on ignition on, on filters. So you just, you just uh, um, heat up the filters to a certain temperature and, and, and burn off the organic matter. That's pretty crude. Um, there's... You know, if you're interested in really what's in the water, you need to actually measure what's in the water. This, this is kind of a, a bulk. Really, this is like a bulk indicator. I view it as saying, okay, is stuff coming up off of the bottom? Or if I'm in a plume environment, you know, is it, is it sediment rich or is it organic rich? So, so really, you have to look at this as this is something that you can do relatively simply 
to, to infer uh, some compositional information, but I wouldn't rely on it solely as um, if you really care about composition. Okay, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what n normally what people will do is is look at uh, look at time series of the currents and time series of, of the sediment and see how they're related. And in this case, you see some stuff that we don't normally expect to see, which is is that at, at the peak currents in in the top half of the water column, you're getting less sediment. So, um, yeah. So if you have good time series, that's absolutely what people do. Yeah. Colin. Yeah, essentially that's what we're arguing. Although it's an active layer, it's we we think, you know, in the in. I think it's relatively mobile layer. So so in these really high concentration environments, when things settle out, you have to squeeze the water out of them, and that takes a while, and it leaves them relatively mobile. Um, so that's what we think is going along there. Yeah. So that 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 those aggregates are, are fluffing up and fluffing down with the, with the tidal currents. And when they fluff up, they stratify the water column, which deprives the surface, the top half of the water column, of further contributions of sediment. So, so are you going to be measuring all the way down to the bottom, or are you going to do time series? We're going to measure all the way, we're going to measure all the way to the bottom. I mean, what you, what you can do is calculate the, um, the Richardson number, which tells you whether there's enough stratification to shut off the, the uh, mixing. Um, so in these, we have indications that we're getting to the right Richardson numbers, but because we're not going all the way down into that layer, we can't. So it's going to be a pretty simple set of measurements in October, which is going to be OBS all the way to the bottom and uh, Niskin bottles in the, in the bottom. But the, the Koreans are going to have full suite of, they're going to have a list 200 that they just got. And, the problem is with optics in these environments, uh, frankly, is w once you get down into that, that deep layer, it's so murky that none of the optics work. So that's the reason we were stopping halfway down, was none of the optics work when you get any deeper than that. OBS will still work, but. OK, well, have fun with your projects. I'm going to go and back to summer, so yeah. Thanks, All right, yep, sure. And if ever you have questions about sedimenty things, feel free to contact me. If I don't answer right away, just ask me again and I'll get back to you. Yeah, you guys have this ethics thing. You have all of the yeah. results there. And, um, really cool. Yeah. Um, so you guys have this If you need ethics, hire somebody. I, like <laughs> I see what you're teaching and here. Give them the signature. Yeah. Send them your signature. Yeah. So, you know, we, we built these, we, we built the drifters here, and actually, we just did it work incredibly well. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so I was thinking you should take one of those sensors. 
but the yeah, well, we can put it on our if it's not it says it yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So there's a student using it this summer, but then I can send it to you. With yeah, right. I'm going to be down at the end of August. Is he done by then? Or would would make up by then? Do you think we'll get another site too? No, I think we should. I did the heavy grain location as like a center site, and then did a window around it. They're going to put down. They're going to put down. Yeah, okay. So, but I mean, they don't have to be.